So, we're going to begin. Um, thank you all for attending the uh, Cornell University case study, Drupal as a Centrally Brokered Web Platform. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to be up here on, on stage. Um, I'm, uh, we'll get into introductions in a second. Um, but just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about to make sure that you're in the right room and this will be interesting for you. Um, as many of us know, but maybe many of us want to learn more about, uh, university IT organizations face a distinct set of challenges when trying to adopt open source technology as a kind of a campus-wide solution. Um, often you see lots of organic adoption, which is wonderful and part of how open source gets traction. But when you start thinking about it as like a real official thing for everybody across campus, it gets to be pretty challenging in ways that I think are very unique to universities. Um, and that specifically um, comes down to the fact that you have to support such a wide range of use cases. When you want to try to provide a universal, universal service to campus, that means like large sites, small sites, technically sophisticated people, technically you know, people who need someone else to take care of the details. Um, and I come from uh, an agency background, and you know, it's a bit like uh, 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 Shannon and Rand talk about being like an agency on campus. One of the great things about being in an agency and, and in business on the open market is it's really easy to just like not bid on a project or to say no to an offer or in an extreme situation, fire a client. Um, <laughs> These are things that are hard to do when you're a central services organization for a university, so that creates a challenge. So there's a lot of things you have to cover, you have to meet a lot of different use cases, and at the same time, there's this incredible drive to standardize and economize, because you want to be uh, you know, uh, uh, fruitful, uh, frugal with your resources, budgets are always a, a concern, and you're trying to figure out how to make things uh, uh, be easier to support over the long haul. So in this context for the web, Drupal presents a, an enormous opportunity, but also some specific challenges. And uh, as I think we'll learn in this presentation, figuring out what to standardize, where and how is the key to finding success and, and, uh, with Drupal on campus. And uh, uh, a big part of that, in my opinion, and in a very self-serving opinion, is that flexible and scalable infrastructure is a key to being able to figure out what and where to standardize and have a sane life uh, bringing Drupal, Drupal to campus. So that's what we're here to talk about. And uh, to introduce myself, I'm Josh. Uh, I'm a Pantheon co-founder uh, where I'm head of product, longtime Drupal evangelist. Uh, started an agency way back in the day called Chapter 3. I'm at Outlandish Josh on the internet. But for the sake of this, this presentation, I'm going to remove my Pantheon garb because uh, we're here to talk about Cornell. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to my co-presenters and we'll jump back up later. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm the hosting engineer in the custom web development team. Um, I ar helped architect the Cornell stack, which is basically our LAMP stack that we use on premise. Um, we've been using it for about four or five years now, and I presented at our recent uh, Drupal camp back in last October, and we're having another one this October in case you're in the area. Hi, I'm Shannon Osborne. I'm the assistant director uh, at Cornell. I work in central IT and I run the web development group. Um, as Josh mentioned about firing stakeholders, I don't get to do that. So we're a cost recovery group um, within central IT and I'm one of the organizers of our camp. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history, a little bit of context about us and how we fit in at Cornell. So I've been at Cornell for 17 years now, mostly in the web area. Uh, Cornell is huge, but very, very diverse in the IT space. So there's central IT, and then there's different pockets of IT all across campus. Um, our central IT covers anything, you know, you could be in the voice and data group, you could be in my group, the web group. So mine specifically, though, is a little unique where it functions much like an agency. We are our business within university. So we are cost recovery. We offer an array of services that we'll get into in a little bit, but we really do function just like vendors you'd see um, anywhere outside. So to give you a little context of what my group is made up of, initially we started with the web design group. So it was kind of small and we had a bunch of you know, project managers, web designers, web developers. And then over time, we had these other areas in central IT that were very um, <coughs> distributed. We had a custom apps group and we had a hosting group. And it never really made sense on why they lived not even in separate groups, but under even separate directors across the IT. So over time, we took the web group and the custom apps group and we melded them and we started realizing, oh, to have deeper programmers, that's awesome, that's really great. There was still a missing link though. So then we, you know, and maybe some of you can kind of understand or, you know, sympathize maybe even with this. We got into a lot of 
it's broken. Well, it must be the hosting provider's fault. And then the hosting provider would say, no, it's your code. So there was a ton and ton and ton of that. Well, that kind of diminished once we invited Ryan and the rest of the hosting team into our umbrella group, which is called custom development. So as you, know, you kind of meld and mold your teams together, you try to identify sweet spots. So we had developers, designers, we had folks specializing in PHP, and then we had hosting support folks that did lab stacks. And we had a very big technology platter outside of that, but the sweet spot for us was Drupal. So I don't need to sell you on Drupal. I think everybody's here because they believe in Drupal. It's good. But specifically for higher ed, I think it's really appealing that it's open source. Higher ed's also about community, so really the the ability that you can go out and Google and find resources or talk to your peers and find resources is really advantageous for us. The flexibility to customize, in a minute I'll talk about our proprietary system we were using. So we really did not have a lot of room to customize it. Obviously Drupal, there's a lot of customizations. And then outside of that, it really, we would take on projects in the web team for the cost recovery side and somebody would describe to us an app that they wanted to build and they described to us you know, a brochure website they wanted. And probably many years back, we would have said, oh, okay, well, we'll build you your website and we'll farm you out to the custom apps group and they'll build you your app. With Drupal, obviously, we can bring both together. And once we started doing that, business and our team actually started skyrocketing. So that was pretty good. So stepping back a little bit, the early days of Drupal adoption on campus, it probably started in the library area. Um, they had some sites. They were focusing on Drupal. We're so distributed at Cornell, unfortunately, that we couldn't even tell you who else had Drupal back in the early days. Um, there was no hosting um, specific Drupal provider negotiated. It was pr pretty minimal. We were using our proprietary CMS across campus. Um, it, it was a little interesting. Um, at the point that folks were starting to dabble in Drupal, we had reached a point where we couldn't find a vendor that we could hire to work within the CMS we used. Uh, we would do a Google search on the, you know, try to find some kind of documentation when we had a roadblock. We came up as like one of the top three hits. That was horrible because that meant there was nothing out there and we certainly weren't the experts. So partially because of that and then a few other reasons, we started seeing community adoption. So there was kind of a push of cloudification out on campus so people were starting to look at cloud tools. Um, folks were trying to move away from the proprietary um, CMS that we had. And so we were starting to see Drupal sites go up all around campus, and then our team had started dabbling in it as well. We hit a tipping point. So we kind of got to the point where we had this proprietary CMS. We were all sharing the cost. Well, once half of you leave, there's still that cost to be shared, and the vendor doesn't say, oh, let me charge you less because some of your friends left. That doesn't work that way. And if anything, the vendor started charging us more because I think they could kind of see, how, you know, how the market was changing and they wanted to still have a footprint. So at that point, it kind of became clear to us we needed kind of a, a phased retirement plan out of that CMS and we had to move to something that we deemed was advantageous for us. So that led to a lot of central planning. Um, Ryan will go into mo more details on this, but we did an RFP with Wild Medicine. And at that time, this was several years ago, uh, Wild Medicine ended up going with Pantheon and then we ended up signing with Acquia. Um, however, we've signed with Pantheon as well. You know, our team really focuses on brokering the right choices for campus, so we, we tend to offer them a platter of choices, but we try to make sure that it's meeting all their different needs. So Josh talked about different sizes of sites and different budgets and different, just different needs altogether. So our, our job is really to put something in place for them that we believe is the best of breed and hosting providers so that, as we talked about early adoption, I didn't mention, but People were just hosting wherever. We saw a lot of Drupal sites on our LAMP stacks. We saw a lot of faculty having their students host it in a box somewhere in a room and then everybody forgot about it. So it was really time for central planning to figure something out. Thanks, Shannon. And so uh, uh, one of the things that I can offer from a perspective standpoint is working with a lot of stakeholders in higher education uh, and probably for a lot of you in the room, this story sounds familiar, right? These are the common challenges that, that uh, often uh, people in higher ed encounter and that uh, represent a challenge when you try to take Drupal from organic adoption to a centrally brokered solution. And so I can speak to, for instance, our, uh, our good friends at the University of Pennsylvania, a fellow Ivy. Um, 
they had a, a, a very similar pattern where there was a, a long-standing Drupal kind of practice within the College of Arts and Sciences, and the, the business school was doing its own thing, and they were like way, they, you know, they were off on their own island and, and in their own world. And the communications department had a, a specific need because they were launching some high-profile websites, and we ended up working with them over the course of about two and a half years. Um, and it's still an ongoing process to bring all these stakeholders to the table and iron out what are the truly common things that can be shared, where do you need to have like local or federated control, what's the governance model for figuring out how to actually deliver Drupal in as standardized a way as possible across campus. And it's just one of the big challenges. I think people often will use a term like herding cats, which I think is a little bit, um, it's a good metaphor because visually it's like you can't actually do that. But, um, but I think it also is a little bit dismissive because it's hard work and it actually has to be done. And when you can do it, when you can actually manage to get all the people in the room and have them talk out like their needs and wants and everyone realizes that, oh, actually, we all pretty much need and want the same thing. We just, you know, might have to collaborate a little bit to get there together. It can be a very powerful um, uh, a very powerful catalyst for change. I've been in a number of rooms where the groups of stakeholders come together that, you know, even though they live very similar lives on campus, they don't actually get to talk to each other all that much. And it's a really a wonderful thing for them to realize that in their pursuit of Drupal, they have a lot of common interests and they can reinforce one another. Um, Another challenge, as we remarked before, is sites of all sizes. So a university, when they're considering uh, you know, uh, Drupal as a solution, they need to be thinking about Drupal probably for the largest use cases, such as a flagship website or a, a high-profile professor or research website that could see spiky interest from the internet. You, know, you might have a department on your campus that does things that periodically makes them internet famous or they get slash dotted or the like. You know, on down to the far other end of the spectrum where the crew team probably wants a website. And, and they should have one. That's part of like modern life. The, the, the crew team deserves a good website. And maybe they, want, they should be using Drupal for that website. And the, the challenges are that the crew team versus the, you know, the, the provost, they're very different types of customers. And having a scalable infrastructure that can meet those different kinds of need on, needs on a common platform really helps you out a lot. Because one of the things you're fighting against at a university is this kind of constant entropy for things to fragment apart. So our, our good friends at Arizona State University, they have you know, hundreds of sites that they're running, and they really do span the spectrum from like extra, extra large to medium to, so sorry, extra large to large to medium to small to maybe extra small. And that's a, it's a really powerful thing for them to have a common set of practices that they use for those sites, even though they might be very different in terms of how they are scaling. Um, it just makes their lives much less complicated. And finally, um, when it comes to budgets, uh, you know, uh, our, uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, Cornell operates on a cost recovery model, which means they have to kind of bill for their services, they have to bill for the, 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 any provider costs that they pass through, they have to bill for their time, too, on some level. And this is where it can become a really big challenge for a university and for an IT administration where calculating the total cost of ownership of Drupal, you know, we say like at the beginning, there's a, a bullet point in there that there's no license fees, which is great, right? Like we don't want to go back to the era of proprietary software and just paying for the privilege of installing something. But just because there's no license fee associated with open source doesn't mean that it's free. The cost of open source is that you age while you figure out how to make it work. And, uh, <laughs> and so, and that's not free, right? You know, that's the uh, time is money, hey. Uh, and uh, and, and our, uh, uh, at Pantheon, we are very lucky to work with uh, our uh, neighbors across the bay at University of California, Berkeley, early on. Uh, you know, they they um, worked with us and, and uh, really gave us the benefit of working with us when we were a much smaller company to help us understand these needs. Um, but one of the things that drove them to that was they actually sat down and did the math. Um, they had servers on campus. The servers were effectively free in the same way that electricity was free on campus. Um, and they had a good Drupal expertise on campus and they had some ideas about how they could build a system to manage all the sites on campus and they did a prototype of that whole thing and they put it all together and then they sat down and said, okay, so how much time does it take us to deploy a site? How much time are we spending managing updates? How much time would it take us to onboard um, if we're going to bring in some of these sites that are already running, on, running around campus? Let's just do some back of the envelope math. And what they figured out was that the, with the people time factored in, the total cost for them to do this with their own stack and their own infrastructure would have been 
really untenable for campus. They weren't going to be able to hire 10 new people to manage this stu uh, the stuff at the scale that they had to for the university. So they did a little research and they reached out to us and we were able to help them with that by allowing them to leverage their people time uh, to much larger effect than it would have been uh, if they were just working with their own technology. So total cost of ownership, not just top line cost for licensing, you can zero that out with Drupal, or the cost of hosting if that's something that's recognized or passed through. It's the cost of the time it takes to operate this stuff that people really struggle with. And without good tools and without good practices in place, that's the cost that can spiral out of control very rapidly. So to talk a little bit more specifically about how Cornell University conquered all of these challenges, or is conquering, let's just you know, be a little more honest. Um, <laughs> you can take it over, Ryan. Definitely haven't conquered all of them yet. So um, Shannon started out with a really good uh, slide where it showed her three groups, uh, the, the web design, web building, and then the custom apps, and then the little hosting group that came along a couple years later. And that group started out with three people, and we're now down to one, that was me. Um, and we were, we built you know, these great VMs that um, are used on-prem, we host a bunch of websites out of it, and being one person team to maintain these VMs upwards of 200 of them um, can be a little challenging. So Shannon and I realized, you know, after we got with Acquia, um, web hosting, the hosting environment is not where we should be. We're a web team. So there are uh, companies out there that are doing this, like Acquia and Pantheon, and that's where we need to be looking um, to put our customer sites. It just makes more sense. A lot of times it's cost, it, it costs a lot less for them to host there, and they do it a lot better than what we can do on campus. Um, then that frees up my time to do fun things like project management and play around with Drupal. So it's kind of cool. So, you know, the Acquia contract came on um, through an RFP, um, and funny enough, uh, Shannon's team wasn't really involved with that initially, but that's a whole other story in politics going on. But so you're looking at, you know, what are customers asking for? We looked at our current um, hosting, our little uh, Cornell stack, what it can do. It does pretty well, it's still in use. We have a little dashboard, people can start and stop services. We have Git in there, but it doesn't really work very well uh, all the time. Um, dev test prod, people try to do that through different VMs, but that kind of messes up your code migrations. Anyway, so those are the type of things that we wanted to make sure the hosting provider would do. Um, and obviously, Acquia does it, and then so does Pantheon. So I started playing around with Pantheon um, in 2015. I migrated two really small sites, went really, really quickly, very nice. The customers were super excited because their sites were actually faster on Pantheon and it was a lot cheaper than it, um, hosting on-prem. So now that we have Acquia and Pantheon, we have a multitude of uh, options for our customers. So then, um, marketing the campus. Um, as Shannon mentioned, you know, campus can do whatever they want. They don't have to work with central IT. Um, they can just call us and ask us for recommendations. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure that uh, Central IT was giving them the information they needed to, to allow them to make the decisions that make sense for their sites. So um, it actually happened kind of organically once we started putting sites on Pantheon, even before the contract was officially signed to get the really nice discount. Um, things, word of mouth started going around on campus. Departments were talking to each other. Hey, they have a contract now, get a discount. Or hey, it's working out really well, go with you know what Central IT is suggesting to do. So that's. That's how it's working. Um, we also have our Drupal camp. The vendors can come on site, talk to the customers directly. It's, um, the customers kind of feel more involved that way instead of central IT saying, go do this. It doesn't work that way at Cornell. Cornell is kind of like, here are your options. You make the decision, and we, we're here to help you. Um, what's also nice with the, the platform providers is they have a lot of support behind them. They have incredible documentation stuff that we don't have to worry about writing because it's all their services and tools. The customers can do a search, they find what they need, and they can go merrily on their way, or they hire our team to help them with that. Um, finally, probably one of the really big sticking points was billing. How are we going to do this? Um, each platform provider and hosting provider are going to do it a little bit differently, as do all universities do it differently. We don't really have the overhead to, to do a whole lot of accounting and bill back. So, we had to work with um, both companies to figure the best way forward, and um, I think it's working out fairly well. So, and then of course support. Um, we have a broad range of IT people on campus, and then we have some places that don't have any IT people. 
So we wanted to be able to support those people, all of them, so they should be able to do a self-serve essentially, spin up a site, get it ready to go, and then let us know when they want to go live so we can then you know, build them back. Then we have the customers that are going to contact us and say, please, I just need a website. Please design it, build it, support it after it goes live. That would be the full service. We can do that really easy. We're familiar with the platform. We can spin up sites really quickly and get rocking and rolling, and we'll have a site for them. And then we have that one in the middle, which is kind of cool, which is where my consulting part for hosting come in. And we can sit, sit them down, ask them about their site, what they want to do with it, what they expect to do with it, and what their future looks like. And then we can kind of say, you need to be living here or you need to be living there. So having the, the options and the, the ability to have uh, to support you know, developers who know how to do code migrations and use Git and all that stuff, and then those that don't know how but can come to us to, to do that for them. So where are we at now in Drupal? Um, our group is supporting lots of Drupal 7 sites. We actually have one Drupal 6 site. Um, we are not building any new Drupal 7 sites. Since probably October or November, new projects are all going out as Drupal 8. We have um, about, oh, I don't know, I think we have 50 sites on Pantheon right now. Total, that's across campus. We don't support all of those sites, but those are within our organization. Um, the most recent really large site that we launched, which we're really proud of, is our new IT at Cornell website. It's a Drupal 7 site, and you ask why? Well, it was a really long project, so it started out in Drupal 7 like a year and a half ago. <laughs> and it just, we had so much built into it and so much time and effort into it, it was just not worth uh, trying to get into Drupal 8 before our plan go live. So it's, it's pretty cool though. It's a, basically a custom knowledge base, and we're really proud of it. And our IT communications group um, did a great job with content. You know, people can search for anything they need based, uh, or whatever they're looking for uh, IT related at Cornell. So, and we're, we're continuously developing in Drupal 7. We have sites we need to, to support. People are asking for new functions, new you know, swirly things on our website. So we will still continue to use Drupal 7 and, and build in it. But moving to Drupal 8, we're pretty excited about this, not only just because it's Drupal 8, but the two developer, developer sides of our groups, we have Drupal developers and we have those custom app developers. With Drupal 8 and using a PHP framework symphony the, the custom apps group is really kind of latching onto that. It's like, that's cool, I understand that. It's not like the Drupal 7 way. So they're, they're digging in, they're getting excited about it. You know, they're, they're more accepting to a content management system now. So they're actually starting to contribute to building Drupal 8 sites. Then our Drupal devs, who are still supporting the Drupal 7 sites, they might be a little jealous, but they're meeting, I think is it like every other week or something like that, um, with the, the custom apps uh, team who's looking at Drupal 8 and they're comparing notes and they're being collaborative and they're kind of sharing ideas and like, you know, the Drupal 7 people are like, no, you might need to do more Drupal-like to this and this is how you should do it, not go like crazy custom code PHP things. So it's kind of cool to see that happen with our team. Um, so we won't maybe be three circles anymore, we might be two. <laughs> Um, the other exciting thing about Drupal 8 uh, for our group is we're working on a distro. So thankful to Pantheon who allows us to put custom upstreams, if we can get this Drupal 8 distro out the door, um, it's going to be Cornell themed so people will uh, start a site that has a really nice Cornell logo and it's properly branded. Um, we'll have you know the common functionality that customers seem to always ask us for, uh, for universities, you know, calendar, events, you know, three or four content types, um, a slider, whatever they, it happens to be. And so those things will be all packaged up, along with our single sign-on, packaged up. People can pull them down when they start a site on Pantheon and you know, add a few extra content types if you need them or some content and you should be ready to go. So that's probably one of the more exciting things about Drupal 8 right now. Um, we are also thinking about partnering with some of the other colleges and Ivies in our area to make it broader and kind of more college friendly for everybody, um, but that's kind of in the work still. Um, but along with that, on the community side. <laughs> so we have our official logo, that's our little bear. So <laughs> we're very proud of that. 
so on the community side, we were a little slow going because you know everything we just went through, we had to get our arms around everything. We had to get hosting established. We had to get our team spun up in Drupal. So we didn't have a ton of time to say, okay, well, let's take the community nature of Drupal and embrace it here at Cornell. So we're making progress finally in this. So a couple things. We're on our fourth Drupal camp. So as Ryan said, it'll be this October 19th and 20th. That's been very good and beneficial for campus, and we invite in other campuses. We don't make it specific to uh, Cornell. Outside of that, we've got our Drupal SIG, which I think tries to meet monthly, but again, you know, with a bunch of web shops, everybody's always busy, but we are trying to get a little more traction on that and keep that going. Outside of that, we've got an Ithaca meetup that some of my group attends, and we try to, you know, contribute to those discussions when we can. And then the most important things right now are the D8 distro that Ryan mentioned. Um, I do have a peer web group that I work with, um, our group, Wild Medicine, um, Yale just joined, and Princeton. So if anybody else is interested in talking to us about that, definitely let us know. You know, we started meeting a few years ago. All of us are doing, you know, some of the same things at different universities, especially if we're all each cost recovery shops to some extent. So we try to leverage each other and share where we can. And then lastly, um, soon we'll launch, I think this summer, our Drupal community site. So we have this dream where we can share all of these great resources or any hurdles that we overcame and others can leverage from. So you know, we'll try to share that broadly and would welcome any input from anybody once that's launched. I rigged it. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, sharing. Uh, uh, I, I have a question, I promise, but first a comment. <laughs> the worst question ever. So this was a really ex interesting experience for me to work with the, these two wonderful people in developing this presentation. And I think that they're very modest about their uh, what they've been able to do on campus. And uh, just talking through their story of how things went. It's been a long journey to get to where Drupal can become a fully, you know, um, uh, a, like seal of approval applied. We have the right uh, Cornell logo on the slide and everything else is like uh, uh, approved on campus. So one of the things that came out um, in that conversation that we didn't really figure out how to make a slide around that I'd love to, to the group to hear about is, can you talk about um, the work that it takes on campus to just get together like that, uh, the, the, the design, the style guide, like the sort of the front end aspects of this. We talked about like the kind of a, 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 the Cornell front end working group that's actually in use by people who are doing other web projects that aren't even in your, uh, in your group. So the branding you mean specifically? Yeah, the, just like the kind of like it sounded like when we were talking about this going from like there's the brand guide which is like here's the right logo but it sounds like there's this effort on campus to go from that to like here's a uh, bootstrap based uh, you know, front end that could be used in many different contexts. Yeah. So that would be the theme that we're hoping to pull together. So we're trying to, right now there's a brand book, they call it for Cornell. It's pretty minimal for the, you know, it's basically here's a logo and here's six or seven different ways you can use it. So we are trying to pull together our theme with our new distro that would really kind of lay things out so that they end up looking great on a phone for people and so that they've got accessibility in mind, UX in mind, all those best practices in mind. Uh, trying to pull that all together so it works for everybody is, um, I think Josh said herding cats earlier, that's pretty much how that goes. So we're trying to also get that theme set up in a way that others can just take it and adapt it to them for themselves after that. Cool. I mean, I, I think that's just a very cool thing to do on campus. So um, any real questions are, are welcome up, but let's give a round of applause to everyone for the presentation. <laughs> Step right up. Hi, I actually went to uh, Drupal Camp at Cornell this year. I work at RIT in Rochester. Oh, New York cool. had a great time. So anybody in Western Central New York, please go. It's it's a great time. Um, you mentioned that you're running older sites in Drupal 7 still, and newer sites are being built in Drupal 8. Are you pushing people to upgrade their Drupal 7 sites to Drupal 8, or are you just building new sites in Drupal 8? And if you aren't encouraging people to do the migration from seven to eight, how are you planning on managing these Drupal 7 sites in the future? Sure, great right. question. And definitely a challenge for probably anybody that runs a web group in a university setting. So to be totally honest, 
we're definitely not encouraging anybody in seven right now to say, hey, sign up for an upgrade project. We're, we're so busy that we're just not ready to take that on. Plus, I'd like to see us get several of, you know, a good handful launched in eight under our belt before we go to somebody to try to sell them on something. I want to be able to say, hey, look at these great things. We know what we're doing. We've got a distro. We'll save you money. We'll save you time. And let's get you to eight. For me, that's our path forward. It's to get a good solid base, make sure my team's fully trained up in eight and then go. Um, I think because we're part of the university, the last thing I would want to do is start that early, break trust with any stakeholders and have them be like, why, do you, why didn't you just let me wait? So that's kind of the path we're trying to take there. Okay. Thank you. I'm at a similar university where we've got central IT and we've got edge IT and trying to get those people to work together. It sounds like you're on that road. Have there been any things that have worked really well and some things that didn't work well to kind of build that trust and get people to Stop doing things that they're doing in their communities or their edge IT and bring it to the, the central IT. Yeah, that's a broad topic. So <laughs> uh, I can tell you good CIO leadership over IT really does help. So um, separate from Drupal altogether, I think that's really the only thing that I've actually seen. I mean, you can try a lot of grassroots stuff, but if you don't have a strong leadership that actually wants to bring IT together, everybody still tends to kind of hold back and just stay in their little kingdom. A couple things that we have found works versus doesn't work is being a cost recovery shop. Anytime somebody runs into me, talks to me, calls me, sees me anywhere, they look at them and they're like, are you billing me? So that doesn't open doors, right? That doesn't really you know, foster that sharing or community. So what we've tried to do is um, something similar that Princeton does. They do like Web Wednesdays. So it's kind of like you know, open for two hours, come talk to us for free. The more opportunities, um, like social responsibility kind of business things that we do builds more of that sharing and people kind of sparking interest and go, oh, they really do know what they're talking about. Maybe I should look at that. Or maybe I should look at some of the contracts they have in place. I think that helps a lot. And kind of building on that, were there contracts with vendors in those I edge IT groups before you created this campus one? Oh, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, we don't even get to see it. And honestly, some people have what we call P cards. And if it's low enough, they can just pay with a credit card. And purchasing doesn't even have a list of what those are. So no idea whether you've been able to eliminate those and consolidate. We do know from purchasing that we were able to do consolidations on things we knew about. Absolutely. There's some edge edge cases where people are just paying with credit cards, uh, Cornell credit cards that, you know, to be seen, I guess. It's so distributed, it's hard to put a number on it. Thanks. Um, you mentioned briefly you're using a single sign-on on, on some of the sites. That's one of the things that I'm working on on a Drupal 7 project that's been lagging for an ungodly amount of time. But um, is it, are you guys using LDAP Active Directory? And if so, how's that work between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8? Because I didn't see anything on 8 right. about that. Maybe I just didn't see it. Uh, sure. So I honestly haven't worked on Drupal 8 yet for the single sign-on. Um, one of my colleagues has. Uh, but in Drupal 7, we're using um, Simple SAML uh, PHP and then Simple SAML Auth that does the initial auth auth authentication. Oh, okay. um, we do use uh, our AD. Uh, we have a, a replicated AD server, and that's what we use to get like groups and permit or what we call permits, but AD groups. Um, and I think there's I think there's an LDAT server uh, module as well that, that that's what we're using to plug into that. For eight or for seven? This is all seven. Okay. I haven't worked in eight. I'm sorry. D do you know if has anybody started doing any of that for eight? For I, I can speak to that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, Full disclosure, I have not built single sign-on with Drupal 8 yet, but I've talked to people who have. And there's a, um, uh, it was actually yesterday, but you can, uh, there was a really good session yesterday on um, how Naturally. single sign-on in Drupal 8 is actually a much cleaner process. It's way easier than you think in Drupal 7 because of the re-architecture with Symfony. It's a cleanly um, sort of a, a, a overridable system. Um, so, so on the Drupal side in Drupal 8, I think it gets easier because there's sort of less like hook overrides or form alters that you would need to do. Hmm. Um, on the actual integration side, I don't think it gets any less complex. And like uh, 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 we uh, oftentimes when we do single sign-on with universities, it's some kind of SAML-based, like that's the lingua franca of federated authentication. And then behind that might be an LDAP system or something else. Hmm. If you need to connect directly to the LDAP, that's also an option, although that often is a little bit harder to wrangle with IT in terms of them opening up. Of, they usually don't want to open LDAP up to the world right. and websites, but if yeah. you can, you can. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. I can say we've got simple SAML and shibboleth authentication working in Drupal 8 and got a little bit of documentation or somebody grab me. There you go. Woo! Where <laughs> <laughs> University of Illinois College of LES. All right.
any more for any more? All right, well, thank you. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Don't want to rush. We got plenty of time. Um, so I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about custom sites that you guys end up developing and how you support them. Um, I'm a developer at Princeton, and we have cost recovery as well. But we have like kind of our templated solution, which um, is kind of centrally funded, as I'm sure you're aware of. You've talked with my colleagues about it. But the custom sites, uh, the more that we add that you know, we need to add because they're custom enough that they don't fit into our templated solution, they kind of become like a maintenance nightmare for us. And the more that we add, the more time that we end up kind of sinking into them. So I don't know if you have similar challenges, uh, and maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, uh, I would say the, the challenges between dealing with support and projects on a team is probably one of the biggest challenges we face. So more recently, and I think in talking with my peers at Wild Medicine, they, they might do this better than we do even. Um, what we've tried to do is we bill everybody for support. So what ends up happening, which that part of the model works for us, so we know that we need to support them. We know Ryan can speak to patches and maintenance, that side of support, but we also know that they might uncover a bug that no one ever found, or there might be a, a module that um, an upgrade triggered something to break. So we build them for all of that, and, and so we have a, a good model for doing that. Where it's disruptive is that times the 150 sites that we support, not all Drupal, but you know, just tickets coming in, super disruptive for projects, super, super disruptive. So we've got people who are planned and scheduled on projects and all of a sudden they're off and they're doing support. So it's all billable work, at, you know, so from the business side of the model, that part's fine. What I think Wild Medicine, if I understand it correctly, does better than us is they kind of do like a handoff from project to the support folks. We're trying to do that a little bit more right now. We're we tried to identify a pool of like three or four people and we said, okay, your, your role on this team is a very important role. You're gonna do the care and feeding and keep everything alive for us and keep this moving and you're gonna tap the project people when you need to, when it's something so complex that you can't. It's kind of nice because it gave some folks on the team opportunity to grow, have ownership around something, but I think you need a lot of staff. Back when I had a little team, I have about a team of 20 right now, how could you split them up? Everybody did the same thing. So it was a little more challenging. We did work with vendors more back then, um, but now that we're a team of 20, we do have a little more flexibility to do that. Everybody that does projects, we reserve five hours a week, which I know is not much, for each one of those people to help on support. So that does kind of ebb and flow and it's baked in the schedule. So when any project comes in, there's already that five hours a week allocated for them to work on support so that we don't have this huge domino effect. So I'm from Weill. Yep. <laughs> um, what we do at Weill is we have a, an ops team. That's their focus. They handle the JIRA tickets that come in on these special projects. Uh, whatever fe new features might come in, they get the first crack at it. And as Shannon said, if they can't handle it, they hand it off to the dev team, and then we'll take you know, we'll take it off from there. But it all is billable, you know, from that point. One thing that I would also add, just having seen again across many institutions, um, is uh, separating out maintenance and support from uh, sort of uh, the must-have, like patching and updating of, of modules from from a security standpoint. And a lot of that is, while not fully automatable, there's a, like investing in automation for that upfront um, can really pay off if you're managing, you know, even just 10 or 20 sites, right? And then if those things, because if not the manual labor of that coming in, you know, there's a monthly release or a bi-monthly release for Drupal, there's a security release that's kind of urgent once a year at least, and that disruptive effect of having to, to sort of just pitch in and like, you know, kind of do the stevedore work of like patching all the sites and getting them all out, that can really disrupt your schedule. So being able to reduce the manual burden of that upfront can then let you focus the scarcer human resources on like, when there's a problem with an update or when someone has a request and this, it's more like I need help fixing something or I'm, it's like a tiny mini feature request that comes in that you sort of have to handle as part of that. And then you just, you know, then you kind of run it like, again, like an agency would. You, you have to figure out how to price that stuff. The other thing I have heard about people doing from uh, some of the folks that we work with in the UC system is when, um, you know, they're a universal service, uh, but they also, um, they, they can't say no, but they can put a cost on bringing a site onto their platform. And they've, they've, uh, they've built a, a, a general process where they'll do a quick evaluation of something before it comes in, and they'll just, you know, not to be mean or anything, but they'll just try to say, well, look, 
I know you say this is a Drupal 7 site, but with the amount of um, core hacking that's been done here, this is almost like a custom uh, application that we need to support. So it has a different price schedule uh, that goes along with it. Or you know, we've, uh, we've looked at this stuff and it, a lot of the things are very out of date on this site, so we're happy to take, take it over and, and bring it up to speed, but it's gonna be a little mini project to bring it kind of like up to code before we can really take on the support. And that's a hard conversation to have because you're not supposed to say no to anybody, but I think when you're in a cost recovery model, figuring out a way that is you know, genuine and legitimate and value added to have that, like, what is the cost of what you're asking for? Um, because maybe it's easier for you to just migrate your content into our cool, like, easy to support templates. And that's kind of, it kind of gets the customers on the other side of that to start to think that through that conversation on their own. I have two questions. One of them is uh, for the new centralized news or calendar. How do you have you guys approached that? And if so, how do you plan to solve that, whereby you have news from a central place that needs to go out, or news coming from schools? Uh, how do you ingest that? Uh, the other one is for the IT hosting, how do you do the distros? Uh, I'm from the University of Maryland, College Park, Marketing Department. Don't go too far. I might need some clarification. A couple <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right. So the, the how. So do you mean how are we planning it or the actual technical how on how we're going to pull in new stories from like the Cornell Chronicle? So we do have a central calendar, uh -huh. a central news, that a lot of this, the schools, uh, first of all, submit news, yep. and also they ingest the news. So how do you resolve that? So ours will be very similar to that, and actually Nazrin, luckily, is here as one of our devs. You might want to talk to her since I'm not a dev. Project management's more my background in business, but what we will have is we're going to have a scenario where we're pulling from a central repository um, of events and news. Not everybody, it's kind of weird around campus, wants to pull from the central repository of news. Some of them do, some of them don't. So what we plan to have in our distro is the ability to pull from both central news and central events. And then we also plan to have the ability for them to add locally on their site to it and then also curate because there's a lot that comes in for central that they don't care. So the tagging is not always that great. Uh, but we plan to plan for both in ours. Does that answer your question though? Yes, it does. Okay. What was the second part? The second part is the distros. So if they choose or they're mandated to use the central IT, how do you give them a stack of the distribution that you guys are working on? Oh, how are we going to give it to them? Yes, so or how do you plan on that? We're going to release it via just get, right? Yeah, it's, we're not there yet, but the, the idea is to share it via git so that we can um, just give them access to do it on their own without us if they don't need us. Thank you. When you give something over, what level do you let people customize it? Cause, and do you support it if they make changes and potentially sort of change it in ways you didn't intend or break it? So I think it's a little hard to hear you on the microphone. When we give it away, if they customize it and then come back for support? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to release the distro as a base to use for folks that really have no budget, they just need, we have a lot of folks on campus that actually have horrible, horrible websites, so this will help them immensely because at least it gets them off the ground. But we do, I think communication is everything. So once we explain it to folks, we plan to say, you know, if you, kind of like Josh said, put a cost to everything. We plan to say, go ahead, take it. If you make a mess of it or if you extend the heck of it and come back and ask us to support, we're gonna do, a, um, we do onboarding. So we're going to look at it. We're going to have devs like Nazrin and Ryan look across it and go, what did they do to it? How bad does it look? Can we fold it back in? If they took our distro and really didn't do anything different than we would have done to customize, we would just kind of take it back in and fold it in as support. But exactly what he just outlined, we'd put a really high price tag on it to, and have that conversation with them to help them understand why it's looking like it's like one additional thing that I've uh, seen other folks do uh, somewhat successfully and with like, there's, I think it's a model that can work for the future is uh, 
deciding whether you intend your distro to be customized or not is one thing. So like, is this a distro that is just gonna be cookie cutter, nobody's gonna change anything other than adding their own content, or is it more of a quick start, you could use it, only it, but you might also add a content type or, or add a, a contrib module or, or, or let some of the open source action happen. That's really the question is, is your distro a starting point for an open source project or the end point of a SaaS type solution? Um, and if it's the, make sure that customers understand, which it is, and if it is the starting point for an open source project, which I think a lot of universities want to do because that open source value of Drupal is something that all your clients want to tap in, or not all of them, but many of your clients want to tap into too, try to give them guidelines. Like what you were just saying, the way we would customize it, if you can, get, the more you can have, tell them what they should be doing and be the experts in the room, the less likely they are to end up with a Franken site. We're just uh, getting started with Drupal now, uh, Drupal 8. Um, can we use Drupal 8 as um, our central events repository? Or should we, we can use another system now, but we're wondering, okay, is it time for us to make the switch? As a longtime Drupal evangelist, <laughs> I would say yes, yes you can. Uh, there are probably other systems you could use too, but uh, being, being a central content repository of a structured data like events is something Drupal's pretty good at. Um, you could probably find a, like uh, some good prior art in the in the in the community of people who have been down that road before. Um, I doubt there's like a turnkey solution like oh just add. There's, I don't think we're at the point where like there's a module for that. But you know events are something Drupal's pretty good at tracking. All the data types you'd need to build out your own data model for what an event means for you is is going to be there. And then um, Drupal 8 has the best story ever uh, to date with Drupal in terms of being a, a good web services platform. So it being something that a lot of other clients are consuming. Um, is something that, that you're in a good position to do with Drupal 8. So, go for it. So Nazarene was just saying at Cornell they use a, a software called Localist uh, as a central event hub and then they consume, they have Drupal consuming Localist API stuff to bring things in to individual sites. Right, so building the, they'll be building the Drupal 8 sites with a, with a client ready to go to consume those things. But I, again, I'll say, you could get Localist, you, but you could build it yourself in Drupal if you want to build that site. <laughs> it's all a question of whether, how, much you, how much deving you want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, and, that, and that's very good because that's the specific question he asked. Is there other software that you also use? And yes, there is, and that's a good one. Hi, I'm Ben with Time Inc. Um, do you guys uh, use a make file? Like, how do you update your core and contrib modules? Uh, do you ever, like, do a multi site, share it with, like, a shared database? I wish we had started using make files like years ago and um, not until we just hired a recent uh, Drupal developer who opened our eyes to it. And so um, we're really trying to institute that because they're just really cool and they really help things along. Um, sorry, what was your second question? Uh, oh, multi-site, yes. So we do have a few multi-sites. Um, some of them are uh, splitting themselves out so they won't be multi-sites anymore. But um, there are multi-site installs on campus, um, some fairly large ones um, that we used to support, but we don't anymore because they do have their own internal IT staff. Um, is there like support question around that? I forget. I don't. <laughs> no, I was Wait, just uh, curious about how, how another big organization with like different websites, you know, how do you organize? Mostly. The, uh, yeah, we, right now we have mostly single sites. So, and if we were better at coordinating the the make files and, and figuring all that out, we could have been doing things a lot more efficient, efficiently sooner. <laughs> you said you were doing like an open source thing though, right? Or is that something that you're thinking about doing in the future? Yes. Like share some code between you know, websites? Uh, yeah, I mean, through the distro, that's, that's the plan. So, and 
you know, with Pantheon, you can uh, have your own upstream, so we essentially update one thing and then push it down for those specific modules and for that core. If there's any additional modules added on, that's either the customer's responsibility or we'll do that for those that we support. Great, thank you. And yeah. one just note on the makefile front, um, for Drupal 8 era, um, I would, uh, there's, a, there's a gravitational shift towards using Composer as like the, the kind of manifest of record for Drupal sites because it gives you access not only to, to declare your dependencies for Drupal contrib stuff, but also for any other PHP libraries you might have versus the Drupal 7 era Drush make file, which is really kind of a only scoped to Drupal specific things. So if, you're, if you like doing things with the make file style build, which is super awesome, uh, and you're going to Drupal 8, you should really check out a Composer based workflow. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, I walked in a, a bit after you had started. Uh, I'm from uh, University of Chicago. We have, um, so what we did was we created a, uh, a product line some years back called You Chicago Sites, and it was a multi-site. It got pretty popular. Um, and we, we have hundreds of sites on it now. Uh, and it makes updating very difficult. And uh, it's kind of been like an, in the long run, uh, now we're trying to, uh, it's becoming a little negative, so we're trying to phase that out and just outsource it to somebody else for, um, to voices, I mean, EduBlocks, uh, to do that. Um, and it seems like you guys are heading in a similar direction, uh, creating that distribution. Are you planning on grouping those into, like, smaller multi-sites or just one-off sites, whoever wants it? Ultimately, I think we want to provide the distro for whoever wants to use it. Um, I, I don't foresee us building any multi-sites for customers. Um, I, I just don't think that's the way our team is, is going towards. Yeah. Uh, so we do have, we have worked with customers where we split their, their sites out for them so because um, they were running this to similar problems. As you know, someone changes something on one site and when you update it, it, it kind of blows things up. So um, I, I think the distro is going to help with that to kind of to, to manage that a little bit better, but um, at, most of our sites are now single sites. We don't, we're not doing a whole lot of multi-site. Okay. And I know Josh has. Well, I'm just gonna. That. I'm gonna have to hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta put my vendor shirt back on. Uh, this is my jam. Uh, no, it's one of the main things that uh, we've worked on a lot at Pantheon to try to solve this problem of. Uh, there are specific circumstances where multi-site can work, particularly if you're like really in that no customization SaaS kind of model. It's still a challenge, but it can work. But the, on a campus, usually you need to allow some customization and some freedom, and people want that open source value. So we have a model for deploying from a single Git repository that is not actually running a particular site out to a lot of different sites on campus that can allow for customization to happen at the per site level, scaling to happen at the per site level, et cetera, and that you can manage those deployments much more effectively than you would with like managing a big multi-site installation. So it kind of allowing you to have the, the reuse and uh, efficiency of a common code base, mm -hmm. but also retain um, the flexibility and creativity of giving people their own stuff without having the IT people in the middle of that lose their minds because of the chaos. And, and for uh, the folks from Cornell, when these distributions go out, are these p clients, do they have their own in-house Drupal people? Or are you also going to be the same people customizing the sites for each one? Yes. <laughs> okay, they have their it, own. Cornell, is, it, it could be all of that or uh, any, any of it, really. Um, there, we have really large IT groups on campus that can do all of their own stuff, essentially. They just come to us because they need some place to, to store their 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 site. So, you know, that's when we say there's Pantheon or Zacquia or wherever. Um, otherwise, they're building it themselves. So, yeah, they would be perfect if they want to take our, our distro and the, the built theme and then kind of do whatever they want with it. Great. If they have their own IT people, they can support it. Um, otherwise, there are smaller groups that may have just uh, a content manager or um, a front-end uh, designer, and then they just need to have a place to put content. So they can pull it down. This is our grand scheme or plan anyway. Pull it down. Uh, we possibly might build it for them for a small fee, and then they can kind of take it over and do the rest of it themselves. It, it, all of the above, really. It's, it's quite a distributed and uncentral campus. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to find ways to restructure what we have at the University of Chicago, too, because updating is a headache. So sure. thanks.
respond real quick to. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Step right up. It's not, it's not really a question, but somebody was asking about e events earlier and how uh, how you might be able to manage events. And um, one of the things we talked about in another session was how people are actually doing that with uh, with Salesforce and sharing data between Salesforce and Drupal 7 at the time, but now they just released their, or they they have a release candidate for the Drupal 8 module that does the same thing. So it's, you know, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Lots of ways to integrate things together. Did, did you have a question too? Hi, um, I'm curious to what is the deciding factor between choosing to put one client on Pantheon, what put one another client on Acquia? <laughs> I guess I'm answering that one. <laughs> um, you know, initially when we talked about adding on another uh, contracted vendor, that was probably the first question that came up. How are we going to explain this to campus? It's actually not that hard for us, though. Okay. So a couple of things. I think the, the easiest is what are you looking to do? Are you just bound and determined to have multi-site and that's all you want to have, which we do have a couple of customers on campus like that, and that's pretty much, you know, we do talk to them about Acquia. But at the same time, we also, for us, it's about sharing information. So we try to say, in our team, this is how we're doing it. There's both vendors. Um, this is how one does it. And then we share a bunch of articles, which I think Josh wrote some of them, <laughs> just to help inform them a little bit around their choices. Outside of that, um, and it's kind of changed on how we talk about this, you know, price drives a lot of who somebody's going to look look at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, depending on which vendor has different tiered structures, sometimes that's what drives the conversation. So usually when we sit down with them, we'll ask them about their budget and what are they looking to do. And before we go any further, not naming anything specifically, that really guides that discussion because sometimes somebody meets with us and they're like, I have this much money and I just need to host my site because it's, you know, it's just a one-off site for them. It's, it's different than a college site. Uh, the other thing that we help them look at, and we try to be pretty fair on, you know, talking about strengths with each, is if somebody has emergency.cornell, we, you know, and they need, we don't even want them just looking at that middle tier of hosting with either provider, we really want them to buy into something higher. Mm -hmm. I think Ryan does a great job of explaining to them that, you know, if this happens, you're going to go down, and here's where the strengths in both, both or each. And one question, and I would defer to Josh on this, is I kind of thought back in the day, solar, comes with Pantheon and, and does not, or you have to pay for it with Acquia. I, I can't remember. It's something <laughs> like that. Um, but that was the other thing back a couple of years that used to come up a lot was the solar discussion uh, between the two. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we're at time, and that was a great question and answer session. Thank you all for staying and for your participation.